Excuse me, in one word, what do you love about Providence Place? Family. Friends. Wellness. Art. Compassion. Home. <laughs> Laughter. <laughs> no matter what community means to you, you'll find it at Providence Place in Holyoke. Coming up on this edition of Real to Real. I'm Steve Kiltonic in Westfield, where St. Mary's High School dedicated its chapel to the first U.S. born priest and martyr to be beatified. Nick Morganelli has the story of two UMass hockey players who are on fire with their faith. And Mark Giza has some family friendly movies perfect for school vacation week. These stories and more are just ahead on this edition of Real to Real. Hello and welcome to Real to Real as we come to you today from Toytopia, an immersive special exhibit at the Springfield Museums where you can take a trip down memory lane and rekindle the wonder and delight of all of those fun times that you spent as a child with some really big toys. This exhibit is just in time for school vacation week. We will talk to Maggie Humberston, the curator here from the Springfield Museums in just a bit. But first, UMass hockey is fire on ice right now, and two players have the fire of the Holy Spirit as well. Nick Morganelli caught up with them and their coach, Greg Carville, on the Amherst campus where they discussed their faith and the team's 2019 success. <laughs> The excitement this year with this hockey team has just been incredible. I, I went to one of the games against Quinnipiac uh, and I usually walk in and sit wherever I want. I mean, that was a sold out game. The largest attendance in the Mullen Center for a sporting event. It's more fun when your team wins and those W's are certainly bringing out students and the community to the games. The term they used was, you know, can you wake the sleeping giant? And this year we've, we've, we've done that. Coach Greg Carville, formerly of St. Lawrence University and the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim before that, took the coaching job here two seasons ago. My wife is from Amherst and we were actually coming to visit her parents. And I said, I'll interview. And um, three hours into the interview, uh, Ryan offered me the job. And um, it was hard for me to turn down. Just to, you could see the potential here to build a, a national contender. He and the staff are leading the team in their success. They finished in eighth place last year and have floated in and out of first place this season. I use the term clarity of vision and every single person within this program is, understands our vision and the standards within that are very high and um, we recruit really quality kids who, who thrive under those situations. Two of those quality recruits are sophomores John Leonard, an Amherst native, and Matt Murray from Alberta, Canada. They both realize the blessing they have in Coach Carville and speak highly of him. He's helped us on and off the ice, um, elevating standards, and it's just been a great experience for these past two years. He's one of the best coaches I've ever had. He's just a really great mentor, mentor for all of us, and you know, the way he approaches people and the way he teaches, and I think that's why the, we have the success that we do right now. Reaching the number one spot in collegiate hockey nationally is not easy, but it comes with a lot of hard work starting right here on the practice rink. We really try to be father figures, uh, friends to these kids. Um, and it all, you know, a lot of it's based on Christian's principles for sure. And with that, we hold the guys, we challenge them to very high standards. And uh, it's in every part of their lives. Um, they do extremely well in the classroom. Our team GPA is, is almost 3.5. We all are working towards the same goals, and it's just all the right pieces are moving in the right direction. Um, I've been on successful teams in the past, but like the, the connection and everything that's going on with the operations of this group is just up, up and beyond everything that I've ever seen. John is one of the right wing forwards, and Matt, their goaltender. I got my first pair of skates when I was three, uh, so basically as soon as I could walk, my family put me on the ice. Uh, and then I got my first set of goalie pads for my 
fifth birthday or for Christmas. I just remember that was what I always wanted to do. I'm the first guy to, to play hockey in my family. Everyone else was a basketball player. I like to you know, have the puck on my stick, make plays. Um, I like to shoot the puck as well. They not only play hard, they pray hard. I have that Catholic background, um, you know, so I definitely, I do say prayer for every game. And it's about, you know, kind of the, the preparation that, you know, the routine that I have before games. And I think I, I use it a lot more when it comes to uh, visualization and building up to the event. What I do is I put my faith in, in his hands and, and in my preparation. Both of these young Catholic Christian men are regulars at the Newman Center on campus. He came here as a freshman and found a, a place here at the Newman Center. He lectures for us, he's a Eucharistic minister, and it's always a great witness for the students to see, you know, this great hockey goalie, you know, uh, stepping up at Mass and distributing Holy Communion. I'm a Eucharistic minister here, so I'll do, I'll do some of that um, every other Sunday or so. Um, but other than that, it's more just meeting people, saying hi, talking. I think just growing that connection and a home away from home. You know, with the loss of his friends in that Humboldt accident in Canada, where he, he lost four or five of his you know good friends in that bus crash, uh, really hit him hard. And and we had the opportunity to sit down and talk about that and to work through those things and and um, to help him to grieve through that whole process that he wanted to remember those hockey players and etch their names on his helmet that he plays uh, every game with. His faith is extremely important to him and he is, um, you know, he doesn't broadcast it but it, it's obvious just the way he carries himself and he's just very focused, um, committed, um, again, holds himself to high standards. He's, he's the kind of kid you want your daughter, your daughter to marry. John Leonard worships with his family each weekend. We go to St. Bridget's together and I see him at Mass on, on Sundays. And I know his, his family, his you know, faith and uh, community is a big part of, of his makeup. And so to me, we're very fortunate to have him for a lot of reasons, not just because he's a dynamic player, but he's a, he's a kid that adds to our culture. And hopefully that spiritual nature uh, the spirituality that he has uh, together with Matt will lead them to success, you know, down the line. Um, could be a special year for our team. We, again, I, I, I go back to the quality of the kids in the room and the quality of the staff. And uh, it can't be overlooked how important it is to have good people trying to do good things. Goodness and godliness in a great team that's poised for the postseason. For real to real, I'm Nick Morganelli. Joining me now here is Maggie Humberston, curator of history at the Springfield Museums to tell us more about this really big and really fun exhibit, Toytopia. Great. Hi, Sharon. Welcome. Thank you. This is a fabulous exhibit. It's been with us about a month and it's big fun for everybody. Um, some of the things that we think will be really wowers for people are our big life-size, larger than life-size Etch-a-Sketch, our piano um, from the movie Big. So if you want to come and imitate um, Tom Hanks, you can spend time getting, get your shoes off and get on that piano. We have a life-size dollhouse for kids. Um, and we also have a life-size car from the Monopoly game that kids can actually get in. And so that's a nice photo op. Um, for older folks, we have a nice group of arcade games from the 1990s, which has been a big hit. Um, this exhibit is fun on so many levels. We're particularly excited to have it in Springfield because it's the home of the Milton Bradley Company, one of the largest toy makers in the world at one time. And Milton Bradley came to the city of Springfield in the late 1850s and started that company. So it's kind of a nice tie into Springfield. But we represent many toy companies here. We have Barbie from Mattel, we have Mr. Potato Head, Monopoly games, all kinds of board games, all kinds of toys that tie into movies. Um, there, are, there are video clips of those movies and video clips of old ads for all the toys that you played with 
when you were a kid. And so, there's, there's so much history here. There's so much history here. So you can um, do a chronology of toys from about 1900 forward, decade by decade. Um, we also talk about tin toys that were made in Germany in the 1850s and we even show how those are made. Uh, we talk, there's a little exhibit on the values of different toys. Um, so there's a whole range of things for kids, little kids. We have, you know, the classic things like um, Legos, Mr. Potato Head. Um, there are toy trains that they can play with. They can put things together. So there's a lot of interactive pieces to this exhibit. So it appeals to all ages. It's so much fun. And I was going to say, for school vacation week, which yes. is coming up right. this week, yes. it's a perfect opportunity for parents to take their kids, grandparents to take their Absolutely. kids, because I know like my mom and dad would love looking sure. at all of these old toys. Sure, yeah, absolutely. It's a wonderful opportunity to come to the Springfield Museums. Um, we also have the Dr. Seuss Museum here, and we have a dinosaur show on at the Science Museum. So, you know, for one ticket for five museums, there's so much to do, so much to enjoy. Wow, that's awesome. And you're awesome. inside, so you're out of the cold and out of the snow. Exactly. Okay, well, thank you so much, Maggie Humberston from the Springfield Museums. You're the curator here, and we really appreciate you taking us through and hope that you get lots of people for school vacation week. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure, Sharon. And still to come on Real to Real. Mark Giza has some films perfect for families to enjoy. And St. Mary's High School dedicates their chapel to Blessed Stanley Rother, an ordinary farm boy turned missionary priest who died a martyr. These stories and more are still to come on Real to Real. The Chalice of Salvation, your weekly spiritual connection. I'm Passionist Brother Terrence Scale and your Chalice host, inviting you to take time out of your busy days and join us Monday morning. We welcome Father Warren Savage as our presider and celebrate the sixth Sunday of Ordinary Time. The Chalice of Salvation Sunday mornings at 10 on 22 News WWLP and coming up next on Albany's Fox 23 WXXA. Excuse me, in one word, what do you love about Providence Place? Family! Friends! Wellness! Art. Compassion. Home. <laughs> Laughter. <laughs> no matter what community means to you, you'll find it at Providence Place in Holyoke. Travel with Catholic Communications in August 2020 for the pilgrimage of the decade as we experience the Oberammer Gau Passion Play. Join Springfield Bishop Mitchell Rosansky and Father Gary Daly for the spiritual journey to Germany and the village of Oberammergau. Since 1634, this famous play has been performed every 10 years in this quaint Alpine village. Our 10-day pilgrimage will begin in Brussels, Belgium, and continue through Cologne, Heidelberg, Oberammergau, and Munich, Germany. With daily breakfast and dinners included, Pilgrims will enjoy daily mass in many of Germany's brilliant cathedrals and churches, a cruise on the Rhine River, a tour of Cologne's cathedral treasury containing the staff of St. Peter, and a visit to Munich's famous glockenspiel. Book this incredible opportunity now for $5,439. For more information, go to iobserve.org. Looking for a perfect family film? Here are some of my personal choices that will warm your family's hearts. The Lego Movie 2. What happens when you take Will Arnett, Tiffany Haddish, and Chris Pratt and put them in a world of plastic shiny people? You get an old-fashioned fun film. Now the film is not Oscar stuff, but it's so silly you will laugh out loud. Now this is a follow-up film to the Lego Movie which made millions a few years ago. And to tell you the truth, this one may be a little better. The story is a silly plot about a queen and a Batman character and a mission to take over this crazy plastic world. Good family fun. Go. I 
and okay. smile for a while. Will you help me rescue my friends? You don't want to go anywhere near the Sistar system. It's ruled by an alien queen. Only the toughest are gonna get out of there alive. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? <laughs> yes, you are. The new film, A Dog's Way Home, is a perfect family film. Why, you ask? Because it plays right into our heart and gives us something to cheer about at the same time. The story follows Bella, a shaggy brown pup that gets a new friend in Lucas. These two together is what I call screen magic. It's so real, we love each scene they share, and also the love they share for each other. When Bella goes on a 400 mile journey, we watch this pup become friends and help people with her killer smile. So go, bring the family, and enjoy a sweet little film with a furry friend you will never forget. Over the years, we did everything together. <laughs> Good girl. We chased squirrels. <laughs> we went to work. We even played a game called Doctor. Uh, doctor! <laughs> doctor Gan. <laughs> hey, Doctor Gan. Everything all right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Also, Mary Poppins Returns is still playing. Though I found the film bloated with a lousy score, some people think it was just fun. The best part was watching Dick Van Dyke at 92. He's just the best. Maybe because he is my musical hero. Bright, funny, and cute. But give me jewelry any time. Oh dear. Look, the picture's changed. Looks as though they've broken your carriage wheel. That they have. It's useless now. Useless as a chocolate teapot. The boat is speaking. I'll fix the carriage wheel. It isn't possible. Everything is possible. And you can see my reviews, as well as read other movie reviews, provided by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops online at iobserve.org. That's iobserve.org. In the next month or so, we'll be taking you to the theater, The Majestic in West Springfield, featuring the hysterical comedy Boing Boing, The Hartford Stage in Hartford, Connecticut, The Bushnell in Hartford, Connecticut, and TheaterWorks, bringing you the very best of the theater. I'm Mark Giza. Have a fabulous weekend, and we'll see you next time on Real Culture. You are watching Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Here again is your Real to Real host, Sharon Rulier. Finally today, blessed Stanley Rother, an Oklahoma farm boy, lived an ordinary life, but as a missionary priest in Guatemala, he died a martyr fighting for his parishioners and the Catholic Church in the midst of a civil war. His courageous story resonated with students at St. Mary's High School in Westfield and inspired them to name their chapel in his honor. Steve Kiltonic attended the dedication and explains now why this common man is already on the path to sainthood. On February 1st, after two postponements earlier in the week due to snow and sub-zero temperatures, St. Mary's High School dedicated its new chapel to Blessed Stanley Rother, who was the first U.S.-born priest and martyr to be beatified. The dedication activities began that morning at an 8.30 mass, in which the entire St. Mary's Parish School attended. Father Matthew Alcombright explained to the students the humble beginnings of Stanley Rother, most of whom were hearing about this courageous man for the first time. Stanley Rother was born on March 27, 1935 in Okarsh, Oklahoma, a small farming community not far from Oklahoma City. His parents, Franz and Gertrude Rother, were of German descent. For Stanley and his three siblings, their lives centered on three things, faith, family, and farming. In high school, Stanley played basketball, was involved in drama, and his senior year was elected president of the Future Farmers of America. After graduation, everyone expected him to continue farming as a vocation, but he had other plans to become a priest. During the five years he spent at St. John's Seminary, Stanley struggled in academics, especially Latin. After he flunked his first year of theology, Stanley was sent home. But his strong desire to become a priest never left him, 
and with help from the Oklahoma bishop, Stanley entered Mount St. Mary's Seminary. He completed his studies and was ordained a priest in 1963. After five years serving as a priest in Oklahoma, Father Rother volunteered for the diocesan mission in Santiago Atitlan, Guatemala. He fell in love with the land of earthquakes and volcanoes, but especially the Teotijo Mayan people. Father Rother became fluent in Spanish and the difficult Teotijo language. A missionary priest for 13 years, Father Rother became known as Padre Francisco after his baptismal name of Francis. His love of farming and the land connected him to the parishioners, who were of extreme poverty. In addition to his pastoral duties of ministering to baptisms, marriages, and first communions, Father Rother fixed tractors, plowed the land, established a farmer's co-op, and built a school, hospital clinic, parish hall, and the Catholic radio station. During the 1970s, political turmoil and violence in Guatemala escalated, especially against the Catholic Church. Disappearances became a part of daily life as a paramilitary death list surfaced. In January 1981, Father Rother went back to the United States after receiving imminent death threats. However, he returned to Guatemala three months later saying, the shepherd cannot run at the first sign of danger. On July 12, 1981, Three masked men broke into the parish rectory and after a struggle, executed Father Rother, who died serving the people he loved. Father Stanley Rother's body was returned to Oklahoma for burial. His heart, however, was interred at his Guatemalan church at the request of parishioners. A cause for Father Rother's canonization was opened in 2007. In 2016, Pope Francis declared that Father Rother was killed in odium fidel, in hatred of faith, making him the first martyr born in the U.S. In September 2017, he was beatified at a rite of beatification ceremony in Oklahoma City. Father Alcombright felt St. Mary should have a place at the school where students could go during the day to reflect and pray. I think it's so important with, with Catholic education specifically, we have an opportunity to have our Lord present in the Eucharist, a place for prayer, a place for where students can go just to, to be quiet with God, to listen to His voice. And so I thought it was, it was crucial that we put a chapel back in the school. The school already had a small room which previously served as an office, storage area, and makeshift chapel for a couple of years. Over time, it just needed updating. It needed um, just a new look, um, and it needed an opportunity for students to be more aware that it exists. Father Matt challenged students to choose a patron for the chapel. It's their chapel, so they should be able to, to pick the patron they want, the patron that speaks to them and in a, in a life that, that is encouraging and, you know, and influential to them. Students research saints and others to come up with an appropriate individual. From a list of 24 names, four finalists were chosen. St. Pope John Paul II, Mother Teresa, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati and Blessed Stanley Rother. In the end, Blessed Rother received the most votes from the student body. I liked how he went back to Guatemala. He would not abandon his people. And also he was a farm boy like myself. So I, I just kind of connected to him a little bit. His never ending faith, he would, he would not back down to uh, oppression. And especially in today's world where you gotta, you gotta keep your fortitude. I think that the most important part is that we have someone who's just like us, who's very common, who most people don't know about. After listening and learning about his story, it kind of inspired me to be more like courageous and have that faith and have God back me up. One of the things that we talked about with the students a lot was his talents. He was a talented farmer. He was a talented outdoorsman, and he used that in his ministry. So he took what he was naturally good at, what he naturally loved, and he made it a part of his life. He was able to see that God was calling him to something more than what he imagined for himself. That's a great lesson for students who are at a point in their lives where they're looking forward to what they might be doing in the future. I think the most, the, the most inspirational thing is, and I think you know, all the other students have said it, he's an ordinary person. He followed a path of virtue, he followed the path of the gospel and, and wasn't afraid. As we have you know, on our sign here, um, you know, his great quote, I give my life for my people, I am not scared. The chapel is located near the main entrance, so anyone entering the school would see or pass by it. We wanted it to be in a place that was visible so that uh, people would be aware that we had done this project and that the Eucharist really forms the heart of our community. According to Father Matt, the room received a complete makeover, inside and out. 
we really cleaned this whole area up. We painted the walls and uh, painted the room over. We did we rewired electrical so there's not electrical sockets in the walls. And the tabernacle we found it was a re, you know just a tabernacle that hadn't been used and our sacristans like buffed it up with you know uh, cleaners and stuff like that to make it really look nice we acquired the icon of Stanley Rother and next to the icon is the relic of Stanley Rother that's a first class relic so it's a it's a piece of bone from his body on the other side of the chapel we have the image of our lady of the rosary uh, she's one of the great marian devotions of the people of guatemala and then of course most importantly we have the blessed sacrament there right in the center uh, you know the tabernacle with the the beautiful crucifix above it the chapel altar was already in place. Panel doors were added for privacy. LePage wrote Blessed Rother's biography, which appears on the outside walls of the chapel, and selected the pictures that tell his life story. Blessed Rother's younger sister, Sister Marita Rother, also entered religious life. She belongs to the Adorers of the Blood of Christ congregation in Kansas. Father Matt emailed her community, informing her of the chapel and explaining some of the history of Westfield and St. Mary's. Sister Marita called Father Matt a few days after Thanksgiving. She's so gentle, she's sweet, and she was really, really, you know, very emotional on the phone. She was very honored that the students would, would pick her brother, you know, because he's, he's brand new. There's not a lot of uh, things dedicated to him at this point. Sister Marita wrote a letter to the students, which is displayed in a frame outside the chapel. She didn't write to you know, the faculty or to me uh, or to the community, you know, the broader community of Westfield. She wrote to the students because this is their chapel and they were the ones who selected her brother. After the mass, the dedication continued as students walked over to the high school and assembled in the school gymnasium. Father Matt read the letter from Sister Marita. My brother, Thomas Rother and I, Sister Marita Rother, are honored, we're grateful, and we're appreciative that you have selected Blessed Stanley Rother, our older brother, to be the patron of the new chapel in your school. Father Matt led the students in prayer for the cause of the canonization of Blessed Stanley Rother. A prayer of dedication was recited before blessing the chapel. Blessed Stanley's next step is sainthood. For this to happen, a miracle is required through his intercession, which must take place after the day of beatification. Until then, may blessed Stanley Rother continue to shine a light for our youth, an ordinary person who wasn't afraid to live an extraordinary life. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic. To honor its native son, the Archdiocese of Oklahoma plans to construct a $39 million blessed Stanley Rother shrine that will serve as his final resting place. Once built, the 6,000 square foot shrine complex will include a 2,000 seat church, a chapel, classrooms, indoor and outdoor ministry facilities, as well as a museum. That should be pretty impressive. And for this week, that's real to real. We really want to thank the Springfield Museums for hosting our visit today. And if you have any children who will be off this week on school vacation, it would be a really great day trip. With five museums, there's definitely something for everyone. And again, we have a link at iobserve.org with all the details on Toytopia and all of the museums here at the Quadrangle in Springfield. And with St. Patrick's Day now just a month away, it's time to celebrate. The Sisters of St. Joseph of Springfield will host their annual Irish Gala next Sunday, February 24th from 1 to 5 p.m. at the Castle of Knights Memorial Drive in Chicopee. The fundraiser will include dancing, raffles, food, warm corned beef sandwiches, a cash bar, and music by the Andy Healy Band with Mary Ward. Proceeds will benefit the Sisters of St. Joseph and tickets are $25 per person and are available at the Sisters of St. Joseph Congregational Offices at 577 Crew Street in Springfield during normal business hours or you can contact Sister Harrington at 413-536-0853 or eharrington at ssjspringfield.com. And remember, you can also find updates anytime as well as information and news on the Catholic Church at iobserve.org. We also update our Facebook daily with news of what our reporters are working on. Check us out and friend us at Catholic Communications. See you next time for another edition of Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation, funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal and the support of you, our faithful viewers.